Dear Family is a podcast hosted by Rachel Steinman, a writer, an educator, and a mental health advocate. And Rachel gets us up close and personal, so we feel a strong connection, familiarity, and comfort with her guests. Dear Family will explore many angles of mental illness, including isolation, drug addiction, and even suicide. Sounds like fun, huh? Well, you'd be surprised, actually, because once we get so invested with Rachel's guests, we can actually relate to many of the issues that naturally arise during her conversations, and what often follows is a knowing laughter. So, yes, expect tears of heartfelt empathy, but don't be surprised if you chuckle now and then. So settle in and join us as we search for true healing and journey with Rachel and her most interesting guests. Zach McDermott is the author of Gorilla and the Bird. His witty, intimate, and personal memoir is the tale of a mother's unconditional love for her bipolar son. Zach grew up working class, hovering above the poverty line and witnessing crime in Wichita, Kansas. His mother was a school teacher who tutored Crips and Bloods, giving Zach the desire to give back by becoming a public defender for the Legal Aid Society of New York. The story of Gorilla and the Bird begins with a big bang when 26-year-old Zach suffers his first major psychotic break, complete with hallucinations that he's the star in a television show about his life. Zach, the gorilla, has to fight to regain his sanity after he's arrested and committed to Bellevue Hospital. He turns to the only person who hasn't given up on him, his mother, the bird. Channing Tatum's production company is making a new HBO limited series based on his book. And Jean-Marc Vallée, the director and executive producer behind Big Little Lies and Sharp Objects, will be directing while Zach will be co-executive producing. Welcome to Dear Family, Zach. Thanks for having me. I first heard about you on This American Life, and I immediately had to download your incredible memoir. And I loved it even more because you narrated it. Oh. And with tears in my eyes at the ending, I shot you an email. And I was so excited that you got right back to me, and you graciously agreed to be on my podcast. So thank you. No problem. And just so listeners know... We're in your Hollywood apartment where your This American Life episode was recorded. So you might hear some background. Yeah, that was an airplane. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Exactly. Dear Family is a podcast about mental health, but it's also about family. And although we've never met until literally a few minutes ago, and although we likely grew up kind of worlds apart, I feel kind of like we're kindred spirits, partly because... You were a defense attorney, and I guess you always will be in your heart. And my dad's a criminal defense attorney for oh, the last yeah. 50 years. Your mom is a school teacher, and I was a school teacher, and I still consider myself a school teacher. And my mom is bipolar, and you're bipolar. And my heart always goes out to people that are bipolar. I actually love bipolar people. I love the creativity that comes with the cuckoo. The cuckoo. Yeah, in a way. Okay, there we go. But there's something really awesome about it. Can you just tell us a little bit about your family? Oh, yeah. Well, wow. so I guess let's start with the bird, huh? Since she's uh, the bird. My book's called Grill and the Bird. The bird is my mom. And, you know, the sub is a memoir of madness and a mother's love. And it's about as pithy as you could kind of really state what it's about. That's really what it is. It's insanity and it's my mother's love kind of pulling me back from the brink a couple times over. She was hard to write because she's such an amazing woman that you feel like you'd be in over the top with it. You're like, I'm writing it and listening as a reader and being like, come on, dude, dial it down a little bit. You love your mom. That's great. And it's not so much about like, I love my mom, my mom's great, but like, she just is great. She does a lot of good for the world. Like, I grew up in Wichita, Kansas. And you know, as we said, we were, I'd say like fairly lower middle class. We had one teacher's salary. My dad split when I was pretty young and three kids. And then my mom would kind of take in any stragglers too. So we lived a block from my high school and came to be that like, we became the gathering point after school for this group of guys who were kind of some combination of friends with me and my little brother. And then like their friends kept just kind of like, it just kept growing and growing. Then the group, like pretty much everyone was black. Most were either Crips or Bloods. And my mom just every day after school would like throw, you know, a bunch of frozen chicken breasts and a crock pot 
throw a little seasoning in there or whatever, feed everybody, help everybody with their homework. We'd all kind of lift weights, play video games, whatever. And there was no one that wasn't welcome. And she, you know, out of these kids, she started calling this thing Power Hour. And some of them went on to jail. Some of them went to college. A couple of them did all three. And she's just kind of always had an eye out for the discarded, if you will. And she has no money. She shops at Walmart, JCPenney, and basically gives herself and everything she can away to anyone who needs it. Like she's kind of remarkably, some would even say perhaps to her detriment, selfless. And she's incredibly strong. She like, you know, my dad left when she was 28. She had three kids at that point. She was working at a grocery store. She went back to school. She got a master's. She eventually got a PhD. And yeah, when I was in the psych ward, she came and visited me every minute of every visiting opportunity. Like as soon as she heard I was in the Bellevue psych ward, she got on a plane from Kansas and flew to New York. That skims the surface of her. There's other family members. So I don't know if you want me to, right, I guess, okay. here well, right So I know that's a <laughs> yeah. great background. And yeah. oh my God, your mom just sounds like a true saint. You know, there's nothing like that mother love, but yeah. she extended it to other people in the community. Well, so I know that your uncle Eddie was sent to a state mental hospital in yeah. Topeka for paranoid schizophrenia. Yeah. And I think it was on the same day you were born. Yes. And you talk about how you believe it may be why your grandmother's so close with you because she lost her son and had a new baby boy come into her life. Yeah. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, all signs point to that being the nexus of our connection. I mean, we get along very well too, but like we just have, I think, kind of similar personalities. Yeah, the day... My uncle had just OD'd on PCP for the, I don't know how many of the time, but it wasn't his first. And he had to be airlifted and had like a a heart operation. But then they were told like, there's no way he, you know, he can live on his own. So arrangements were made that he actually was court ordered to a state mental hospital. And the day I was born was the day the men, you know, when the white coats came and picked him up. So my grandma had my mom in the hospital, like, I don't know how long of a labor I was, but I know it was really long and, like, difficult. And so she's got her daughter in there, like, in the midst of this difficult labor. And then her son, she's, like, waiting for him to get taken away. So after he leaves, she goes to the hospital, I'm born. And then he died 15 years later. I remember I was 15, and I told my mom that he had died because my grandma called me, and I had to go pick her up. And yeah, so he lived the last 15 years of his life in a psych ward. He'd come home a couple times a year, but that was... Well, so you grew up knowing that there was mental illness in the family. Did you ever worry that you would inherit or develop schizophrenia? Yeah. I mean, he's right there in front of your face. But, you know, I mean, a couple times a year. But, you know, he looked crazy and he looked really scary. And, you know... I feel like I'm in the club and I'm using these words like without any sort of pejorative tent behind them. Like I self-identify as crazy. So even though I know that can be kind of problematic, I'm going to go ahead and call myself and my uncle crazy. But <laughs> I think you can call yourself crazy. Right. You can't call it right. Yeah. I can call my uncle too. Yeah. Because <laughs> right? he was crazier than me. You know, he would come home and like he looked like Charles Manson and he had like this really unruly unkempt hair and beard and he didn't like to shower and he drank like eight Mountain Dews a day and he was never not smoking like either a cigarette or a cigar or a pipe and he would just always ask me like you got any ganja and that was his like and you were a kid yeah yeah <laughs> and he would come up and like he was a Buddhist so he would be like in his, in his so room funny. like chanting you hear this like booming voice you're four or five years old like nam yo ho in rick yo nam yo ho in rick yo <laughs> You're just like, what is that? Like, it's so foreign and it sounded scary to me. And he would like do that and then play ACDC really loud. And you're just like, this guy is terrifying. You know, he just, he really scared me when I was little. Right before he died, I'd finally like come to a point where like I realized he wasn't scary. Like around 13 or 14, he would come over and he would like yell in my face. He would like get really close to my face and he would go. "Ah!" (laughs) And one day he did that and I just did it back to him. And so from then on, like anytime we'd see each other, we would just like shout in each other's faces. And that was our like way of bonding. 
But yeah, he scared me a lot beyond his like physical presence being scared as a little kid. Just the thought of becoming him scared me a lot because we look a fair amount alike. That whole like born on the day he went away thing, I think kind of tied us to each other in family lore. And then also just a lot of the stories I heard about him, like I felt similarly when I started getting older, you know, like in my teens and stuff, I got in a lot of trouble. He got in a lot of trouble. And he was like a really cool guy. He was like this, if not for like his severe mental illness that like limited, you know, had him so drugged up that like, you know, he didn't really have the capacity to engage in witty banter or anything like that. But he looked like a badass. Like he was, you know, always wearing these wallet chains. He had this like great 70s swag. He had fantastic taste in music. They called him Fast Eddie. He like drove a motorcycle. He'll be a great character for the TV series. Yeah, (laughs) he's awesome. And his like, you know, devil may care, rebel without a cause attitude was cool. And I have a line in my book, something like me and my brother both kind of competed trying to be him and trying to not be him like drinking and doing drugs and stuff but not as much as uncle netty like you don't want to be uncle netty he was just a constant reminder of like kind of that's where things can go you know that's so interesting well i can see you know if you feel like you look like him and you have this great beard (laughs) so i understand why you call yourself gorilla why did you call your mom the bird it's both of it. Like, I mean, as you said, I kind of look like a gorilla. Well, you don't look like a gorilla. I mean, a you just bit. have a thick black beard. Well, what if I go like this? Well, there you go. <laughs> Let the record reflect that was a good gorilla impression. Yes. So, yes. no, I do a really good gorilla impression. And I've always, like, had, like, kind of a big chest growing up and been really hairy and stuff. So my mom, and I always loved gorillas. So, I don't know, my mom started calling me gorilla when I was little. And I started calling her bird just because she looks like a bird. She's got... Like, we both kind of have this, like, slightly beaky nose and, like... Okay, I don't think so. Oh, come on. Okay. There's a little bit of... A, no. Come on. Barely. Barely. I would never. Okay. All right. All well, right. In my opinion, our noses look slightly beakish. Okay. And she has this thing where when she gets upset, she, like, tilts her head around in these jerky little half rotations that make her look like an excited <laughs> little bird. Just... And yeah, she's, yeah, and she's short and she's got like, she's a busty woman. She just kind of looks like Bert. I love it. So yeah, I call her the Bert. So I looked up Wichita, Kansas uh, on Wikipedia because I've never been like there. said native too. Did I? Oh, like, good. I looked I, up Wichita. Wichita. And I learned that it's the birthplace of White Castle. This is just a total funny side note. Yeah. Which is considered the first fast food chain that sold burgers and it's a Midwestern thing. And my dad's from Chicago and he loved White Castle. He I had no idea that was true. Oh, okay. Well, yeah. I don't even think we have a White Castle in Wichita. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to double check, but Are this you is sure what it, it wasn't says. Pizza Hut? It said Pizza Hut too. Yeah. It did. It said Pizza birthplace Hut. of Pizza Hut. Oh, that's and crazy. Anyways, my dad wanted to open up one in Los Angeles. I really don't know much about Wichita. Thought- Can you tell us a little bit? What was it like growing up there? White Castle is an East Coast thing. It says it's a very much Midwestern Man, thing, but I'm going to double check that. So other than White castle was What was it like growing up? Just hanging out in the White Castle parking lot. Maybe <laughs> <all of that. laughs> Pizza craps. Hut. <laughs> yeah, no, it, I mean, it's probably more metropolitan than most people think. There's very much like a country attitude, but, you know, there's more than north 300,000 people there. It's not like, you know, there's three stoplights right, right. and, of you course know, not. everyone. No. But a lot of people, you know, you just say from Kansas, not like, oh, in a farm. And right. You could find yourself in a field pretty easily, but yeah. But it's metropolitan. So yeah. you grew up, you know. Suburbs. 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 Yeah, that's what it all is. I just really loved your mom. I love so much that she was tutoring kids who would normally be forgotten and fall through the cracks. And it's obvious that her advocacy for troubled kids and also the crime and poverty that you grew up with was probably what pushed you to become a public defender. Is that why you chose to do that? I think so. I mean, it's certainly like she demonstrated a baseline empathy of not even like giving people multiple chances, but just like She just didn't really care what anybody did or was alleged to have done. They were still like kind of welcome at the table. And I just like saw through her 
how treating people who have been neglected with like a little bit of love could make such a profound influence on their life. So guys that, you know, some of the guys that I'm talking about, I know have gone on to do bad things, whatever you define, you know, I think the bad and stuff like that are just kind of problematic words, but things that are against the law that we as a society have decided are not good for us. Right. But I've kind of also just seen like, you can almost see in a single individual, like alternate realities, like how this could play out or were they not here doing their homework? Cause you know, kind of like what they get into anyway. So like, if we remove this, like one little piece of positivity and guidance from them and this one place of kind of unconditional love and lack of judgment, then what happens? So yeah, I think she kind of like that really informed how to like treat people and view people. But then I also went to, you know, I went to school and I just had a really good African-American studies professor and ended up majoring in that and studied a lot of like, I started reading a lot of prison memoirs and a lot of race theory and stuff like that. And that's where I really got the passion for criminal defense. Like this Amazing. Is- I love how when you write, you write with kind of this dry sense of humor yeah. that surfaces very easily. And while you were also public defending, you were doing stand-up. Yeah. And can you tell us about that? Yeah. You know, like, it was fun. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, bet. No, That's I mean, scary. Well, you know what? It's not that fun, actually. It's actually pretty <laughs> horrible. You know, when you're first starting, you go to open mics you pay five bucks sometimes you got to buy a drink too you sit in a room with 10 or god willing 15 other comics so that you can pretend to have an audience but you know there's 10 people there no one cares no one's paying attention to you everyone's in their own head just like getting ready to do their own thing they don't want you to succeed because it's competitive. So it's just like you go in and you're saying the same thing every night to a room full of totally different people. You can like totally lose your confidence in stuff that like actually works in front of real audiences just from running in front of comics. And you know, you need to be prepared to do that for five years if you're gonna like give it five minutes. That's how you do that. And five years is quick, you know, to like actually have some success. What was your material mainly about? This is probably bluer than your audience. No, it's totally, you could say whatever you want. It's explicit. <laughs> well, I'm going to quit minding my P's and Q's. Oh, yeah, there. you totally can. It's um, explicit material. No, you know, I mean, I did like, I was all over the place. Like every now and again, one time I did a, a character for a full set where I did stand up like I was a old timey baseball player from like the 1800s and I dressed up and like looked like Daniel Day-Lewis from There Will Be Blood and like, you know, just as if I were a guy teleported here from the 1800s, you know, just like, on my day it was called rounders. We didn't call it baseball. We played until it was too dark to see. There were five balls to a walk, four (laughs) strikes to a, whatever. That was one thing. But then I also like at one point, I don't know, leaned into hip hop pretty strong and would like kind of talk about and or sing songs that I both thought were ridiculous and kind of loved. And it was kind of like a high energy antagonistic sort of persona I would have there. I do like a lot of, I would go after the crowd. Like a lot of comics are scared of crowd work or like getting heckled, but I would love a heckler. Like if I could ever get one early, like somebody say something, it's like, all right, well, here's my next three minutes. I love that. Well, yeah, you, I mean, you were brave. You got over the fear of your uncle. Well, you can get over anything, probably. <laughs> if you're like funny enough to be up there, and most people aren't like up there, you know, like most people right. are horrible. I'm not saying I was any good, but let's say you are right that you're good enough to be up there. Well, you should be able to take most comers right there. But, you know, there's funny, witty people in the crowd, too. So, like, you have a microphone. You know, like you're the only one with a microphone. So if you can't take someone down when you're practiced at it and you have a microphone in your hand, you should just give them the microphone and retire. (laughs) That part might have been fun. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Zach, you were just 26 and you were doing the lawyering and doing stand-up and you weren't getting much sleep at that time. 
and which may have pushed you into prolonged mania. And I've experienced this with my own mom. And it pushed you into your first psychotic break and right. you had hallucinations. Yeah. And that's how your memoir begins. And it's just like a wild ride. I just loved it. It's one of my favorite beginnings to a book. And it's this kind of Truman Show moment where you're a reality star in your own TV series. And you think everyone in New York City is a supporting actor. Can you just tell us how did you get to that state of mind? All right. So as you said, the lack of sleep, I think, kind of was, you know, it's both like symptom and cause of mania, right. right? So you're not sleeping, maybe you're manic or you're not sleeping, you soon will be manic, right? right. So I hadn't been for months and I was burning the candle at both ends, practicing law, doing the comedy. I was smoking a ton of pot too, which probably didn't help anything. But I had been going really hard with the stand up, and I was having some success. And this guy who I call him the producer in the book, but he had, he really did have like a ton of connections. I met a lot of famous people through him. He had a super famous sister too. I mean, like super famous. So I had this guy I was working with, and I only mention all that to, because like he was in my ear always like, you're my project, you're my guy, like you're my next thing. We're going to write a pilot. You're going to star in it. And like, we got kind of far. Like we, I did write a pilot. We had a casting call in Union Square where like, you know, we have real actresses coming in with headshots, like reading to be my girlfriend in the show and stuff like this. So I thought like I was really like almost there. And at the same time, I was just cracking up. So we had had a meeting with a producer who had done some work for MTV. Things seemed to be getting serious. I thought I was soon going to be quitting my job and on to fame and fortune, right? So I can't really, like, there was an internal logic to, like, that guided me through this little psychotic break. But I can't tell you that there's anything objectively lost. It was like, oh, well, anyone would think they were being filmed by hidden cameras at this point. Like, it's hard to explain how one comes to believe that one is the star of a TV show that no one told them was going to be made. But in my head, I thought the producer, he's a genius. He knows I can't act and that I'd be stiff on camera, but he knows that I'm good at like, you know, off the cuff interactions. So don't tell me we've started. Let me get in the game. Let me figure it out and just play around on camera. And like, I'm basically method acting myself. So interesting because it's like, <laughs> in a weird way, it's kind of like logical. Mm -hmm. It's not like you are hallucinating that you're like Shift. walking on Mars yeah. and there are aliens around right. you. Well, so you ended up in Bellevue yeah. and where you famously said it's such a great line, regaining sanity in a mental hospital is like treating a migraine at a rave. Yeah. So good. But, you know, this part of this book is about how you truly are one of the lucky ones because you had that unwavering support from your mom. Her name is? Cindy. Cindy. And she was there every step of the way to help you get out of the system. And I just want to give a shout out to all those parents out there that are unwavering yeah. with their kids because it's not easy. Or maybe you're a child supporting your parents. Yeah. But you've talked a lot about how difficult it is to get out of the state mental institutions. And I know that you have a lot of compassion for the people that you saw in yeah. the institutions. I can tell you're clearly, you know, very empathetic, sympathetic person. Let's first start by you telling us what do you remember about being in there? And are your memories based on your mom's notes or the hospital notes? Because I'm sure they drugged you. Well, some of it is definitely my mom and some of it is definitely me. Like, you know, sometimes I've been so deep in the, you know, the throes of psychosis that, yeah, I wouldn't trust anything I remembered or it just feels like a blackout. Like, I don't remember that week, you know, but there's plenty that I just do and did remember like it doesn't mean you can't retain memories just because you're not perceiving reality correctly of course 
you know, and you're also a writer. So in your back of your mind, you're probably like cataloging totally. things. Yeah. And yeah. there is a like deconstruction that would have to take place a little bit like did that happen or like you're sorting out what you were perceiving versus which, you know, that comes with like lucidity and hindsight, common sense. Like, well, you know, the I'm trying to think of, of an example of something that I might have thought was true, but later wasn't. I mean, when I first got to the hospital, I thought that when they said the doctor will be with you soon, that we may or maybe a meeting with Dr. Dre. And there was an African-American guy in there laying on a stretcher who looked a little bit like Dr. Dre. And I was like, oh, that's the sign. That's the this. That's the that. So obviously, when I come out of this and I start writing it, it's easy for me to go, well, that one's wrong. Right. <laughs> I don't think any of them were like close calls, though. Right. I don't think there was a lot of like, well, is that really the? Because it's kind of just like, yeah, that would happen. But the that characters that you that met yeah. that were with you were so well written. Yeah, I mean, it's a terrifying place. You know, one person I talk about in the book is this guy I call Monk Monk. And he was like 6'6", six, six, probably like at least 230, I would guess. And just chiseled, like no body fat, all muscle. And, you know, he was for some reason allowed to have this stuffed monkey. And he would walk around with it on his shoulder and he would talk to you with his monkey and be like, Monk Monk, say hello to Monk Monk, give Monk Monk a kiss. And like, so he starts doing this when he first meets me and I'm semi comatose with drug, but I'm just like, all right, hey, Monk Monk, you know. And then he starts talking to me about like how many guys he's turned out in the showers over the years and how he's a navy steel and how i'm cute and how he's a black belt and how you know he's been here for a long time and people have like tried to take him out before and he once ripped that water fountain off the wall and that's like all right you meet that dude okay next person you meet this person seems very chill and calm and maybe like they don't belong here oh what are you in for double murder what do you mean well I was convicted of a double murder, but I was, you know, insane at oh the time. God. So like, oh, okay, who's yeah. next? The yeah. woman screaming, you know, at the top of her lungs. And, and it just doesn't end. Like there's an old man masturbating in the corner. And this is like, yeah, that's the rave where you're supposed to treat your migraine. It sounds terrifying. It's it terrifying. definitely does sound terrifying. No but, you know, I also know that you were counseling some people that may have been on the spectrum of dealing with mental health issues and that needed, you know, some of your help, yeah. in, right? And I know that you think that there's systemic injustice yeah. which in the prisons and yeah. in the justice system. So I'm curious especially now that you've moved to Los Angeles and mm -hmm. you see the, just the record numbers of homeless people in the mm -hmm. tent cities. Do you have any thoughts on that? I know it's kind of broad. Broad. Yeah, but... no, sure. I can pontificate and you can steer me where you sure. want to steer me. One thing that's been interesting to me is obviously New York has a homeless problem itself. And I lived there for like nine years before I moved out here. But it is interesting in that to me, I can't really tell prevalence because I feel like it's more concentrated here. I feel like homeless people, you know, you go to Skid Row, it's like almost the whole city, yeah, right? Yeah. Whereas in New York, I feel like everybody's kind of mixed in with the yeah. general population more. Yeah. I walk a lot and, you know, on Sunset Boulevard, there's a fair amount of homeless people. But I feel like, you know, LA not really being a walkable city, it's always like me and them. We're the only right. two people on the sidewalk <laughs> together. And what struck me when I first moved out here is... I feel like the level of mental illness is so much more intense here than New York. We you know a lot of people on the street suffer, you know, from, you know, mental illness in a very serious way. Here, you know, it just seems like people are deeper into it. And my theory is that it's because people are just baking in the sun all day. <laughs> no, but honestly, and you can do it for years in a row. Whereas I feel like New York forces you off the street every now and again, because when it gets like 17 degrees at night, like you'll die if you right. stay on the street. Right. So every now and again, you're forced to check in with some sort of social services in New York. Whereas here, I think you can kind of just stay out there. And I definitely think that's a valid point. I mean, it's also where people come to pursue dreams and, you know, runaways. And, yeah. And we have a lot of issues with at least not being able to arrest 
So Zach, you were suddenly like plunged into this life where you now have a bipolar disorder or a diagnosis and you were hospitalized without your consent. And you write with really vivid detail, you know, my heart went out to you because there's something to be said about like not really realizing that you're ill and then finding yourself in this crazy institution, you're locked up. And I'm guessing that it might have been hard for you to admit that you were bipolar, maybe because you didn't want to end up in going down this path like your uncle. Right. What's interesting, I did, during the period before I went to the hospital, I did have friends that were concerned about me. Like, you're not sleeping, you're not making a ton of sense sometimes, you know, you're just not really being you in a lot of ways. And one of my friends who started saying this to me was, he's a child of a psychologist. So he's like, dude, you're bipolar, I'm telling you. And I, for all my experience with mental illness as a public defender, as the family member of several people who suffer from various, you know, mental health conditions. I was ignorant about what bipolar disorder looks like. I just had no idea. We we're never taught that stuff, which is, you know, more on that in a moment. But one thing I was grateful for was the severity of my break. Like you can't be in a psych ward for 10 days thinking you're being filmed the entire time thinking that your mother is an actor in prosthetics with a voice modulation box and not come out of that going, yes, something just went horribly wrong. You know, that takes a special level of denial to be like, oh, right. Yeah. Like it was so in your face that there was no way yeah, that I you could hit a absolute, you know, brick wall at a hundred miles an hour. I, you know, I was in a full body cast, so I couldn't be like, right. yeah, I can run. Right. I, no, it's true. That's it, a great point. Like, It was so in your face that you just couldn't deny it. Whereas like my mom, her whole life, she was in denial that she was bipolar. She didn't even get diagnosed until a few years ago. And she was in denial because sadly, both of her parents had mental illness. And And she didn't want to be there. Well, and they both died by suicide. So that's just a whole crazy story, which kind of brought me to where I am right now. But that's great that you're not in denial. I'm actually, yeah. you know, because only then can you Well, they gave me a list help. of symptoms, too. It was like this, 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 that. And I was like, check, 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 check. That's seven to seven. Exactly. You know, if- well, but my point being, like, I look back at my mom. It's so obvious she was bipolar since I was born. So, yeah. Well, on that, it's like this. So, two things there. One is the destigmatization thing, which comes from stuff like this. And I think that's just going to, we got a good head of steam going there. We're not where we need to be, but I think that that's only going to continue to improve, really. It's almost becoming like popular to, right. you know, Mental like, I suffer illness from month. anxiety yeah. and I'm not ashamed of it anymore, which is like, all right, you know, I shouldn't belittle that. It's like, it's good. That's right. exactly it's what the hell we're doing To talk right now. about it. That's right. Yeah. I'm just like, it. sometimes it feels like it's becoming almost trendy. But I think the the missing component is just a like schoolhouse rock video. Like this is how Bill becomes a law, you know, this is what bipolar looks like. Like we need to teach grade school kids, like make a little song, you know, if you're bouncing off the walls and you're sleeping with strangers (laughs) and you're not sleeping at all, whatever you call it. I think that's being your future, maybe. Because we know what a cold feels like by the time we're five. Mommy, I got a cold. Mommy, I got a fever. So this stuff doesn't occur until we're in our 20s usually. But if you just to spend like literally 20 minutes a year on this with kids, just like, right. it's like mental one health day, day in your health class, <laughs> right. let's talk about the symptoms. When, when you're yeah. in your 20s, if you have a friend who does X, Y, Z, it's all pretty predictable, you know, quits sleeping, maybe engages in more risky behavior than they would with either sex or substances, delusions of grandeur rapid cycling emotions, you're crying, then you're happy. It's all so simple. Pressured speech. Right. Yeah. Like bursts of creativity that you probably put more stock in the quality of than (laughs) reality would corroborate. So if we just know these very simple symptoms, not only by the time we're in our 20s and this happens, will our friends be able to be like, whoa, slam the brakes. This guy's having a manic episode. Versus what the hell's wrong with Zach? Because that's where most of my friends were. Like, no, this is clearly a textbook manic episode, right? Right. So not only will your friends know that, but you will too. 
because you were in the same class. So once the people start going, hey, dude, don't you think you're running a little revved up? Remember the video about the bouncing off the walls when we were, you know, you're writing on them. You're writing on the walls. It's so true. Yeah. So you then as the sick person might go, you know what? I do have a fever. I have been vomiting. This does sound a lot like the flu. Right. And you know, and our mental health needs to be taken as seriously as our physical health. And I mean, I will say I have teenage daughters. We talk very openly about mental health and anxiety. And Grammy did this because she was manic mm-hmm. or, you know, that we use the language so that one day, God forbid, they are dealing with some form of mental yeah. health issue. It's not taboo. It's not, they can they had come goal. to me. They can talk. Yeah. yeah. And which is, you know, why I'm so happy that you are speaking out. And I think that, you know, you're going to help a lot of people. So, okay, let's talk about this very exciting limited series for HBO. I can see it already. I think it's going to be great. Let's see if I can pronounce his name right. You're going to laugh at me. Channing Tatum Production Company (laughs) is doing this. And Jean-Marc Vallée is who did uh, Big Little Lies, Sharp Objects, and Dallas Buyers Club is directing what? And Wild. And Wild. Oh, one of my favorite memoirs. Amazing. Wow. And you're going to get to co-executive produce, which is going to be really fun, I'm sure, for you. I'm guessing this is why you are living in L.A. now? Yeah, I mean, I don't really need to be here for the project right now. And truth be told, I don't really have any idea what I'm actually going to contribute to it, if anything. I have become good friends with the writer. We'll talk about stuff sometimes. I'm happy to be a resource. I'm really like eager to learn as much as I can through the project. Of course, if I can improve it in any way, I'm here. You know, if they want to ever run stuff by me, sometimes, you know, Brian will call me. Brian Seip is the showrunner and writer of it. He'll call me and say, does this sound right? Does this sound true? Can this happen? And yeah, we'll talk for as long as he needs to know. That's and great. They want it to be authentic. Yeah. And then I'll, you know, I'll write him something later. And But yeah, that's kind of like all I've done so far. But we're, you know, it's not cast yet. We're not it's shooting. It's not cast yet. Okay. Know. Well, I'm guessing in your wildest dreams, even when you believe the entire city of New York was <laughs> in on this TV series, that you never imagined that you'd one day be behind the scenes of a TV series about your life. I not only imagined it, I dreamed it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not... Oh, uh, so you uh, did, about the you life did part, imagine not, but, it. Well, look, the book... It's amazing. I wrote with, you know... I'm not saying it was guaranteed this would happen, of course. Like, this is so much more luck than skill here. But I was trying to do this thing. You know, I was trying to write a book that... That could translate. Yeah, easily. And part of that wasn't so much like, this will get me a TV deal. But I just think, like, the nature and the tone of the book, like, it was a useful exercise to me to be like, what would be a better TV scene here? You know. Well, it's true. I mean, as you're reading it, or in my instance, as I was listening to you tell it, I could really visualize it. It was very in scene. Yeah, that was on purpose. Both right. for like, yeah, a little bit like, well, maybe this will help right. me get it adapted. But I just think the nature of this book, like, you know, it can be kind of frenetic at times and moves quickly. And there's a lot of, you know, there's a fair amount of like, I guess, internal stuff, but there's a lot of external stuff is actually happening too. There's a lot of interaction right. between characters and a lot of plot which i think you know that's the stuff that's kind of readily adaptable so yeah it just kind of became a useful exercise to me like what would you rather see on the screen right now okay put that on the page right now and you hired a production series to go back with you to wichita to meet the cast of characters that you write about yeah is that right yeah and they followed you around yeah and which is so meta you know yeah right And considering that your first psychotic break, you know, you thought cameras were following you. And then you had another psychotic break and it was caught this time, really was caught on video. But you thought that there were other like bigger cameras and trees and stuff. So I'm just curious if you could just tell us how that felt to come back and watch yourself. It was all the things it always is and all the things I always tell people it shouldn't be when it happens to them. It was 
humiliating. I was embarrassed. I was devastated. I felt like the rug had been pulled out from underneath me. So what were you doing? Like, why did it happen sort of thing? No, what were you doing on camera so that the viewers who haven't seen it? Yeah, so... Or listeners, yeah. Scene begins, I'm laying on the ground in a parking lot of a fast food restaurant, a taco shop. It's raining. I'm in excruciating back pain. I'm on my back. I can't stand up. I'm just laying in the parking lot. And this woman comes out and says, do I need to call the police? And I yell like, shut the fuck up from across the parking lot. And I don't know if at that point I thought that was like part of the show or if I was just like really in so much pain and didn't want someone to call the police and was like, you know, whatever, just being a jerk. I'm not sure which one it was, but that happened. And then like we have another scene captured where I'm talking to my producer and friend Jason and we're in my hotel room and he's kind of like helping me get my possessions together and my medication together and stuff. And he doesn't know, obviously, in my head that I think I've just like been in an audition for the role of myself and the TV series based upon the time that I thought I was on TV and I wasn't like it's a spiral. You're thinking you're playing yourself thought. for the TV yeah, series. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah. Why not? Right? Why? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. All that. It was rude to him and acting like kind of a diva. Part of it was just being so tired. I was a little cranky to begin with. But yeah, you just like I saw how I kind of like came across and what I actually said and did. And yeah, it's, it's hard to look at. And it's hard to look at, too, because you feel sorry for the person you're watching. Like, it doesn't feel like I'm watching myself. It feels like I'm watching someone I know really well in the midst of having a really bad time. Well, and, you know, maybe you can find a little sympathy for yourself because you realize if you weren't having a psychotic break, you would normally never act that way. I mean, clearly, you know, so it shows you the power of mental illness that it can like possess you. Yeah. And it's, you know, it's just one unfortunate byproduct of the fact that your behavior is your symptoms and that you're sickness manifests itself in what we would consider like bad behavior so you're like you know whereas a diabetic might faint and you'd feel really bad for him we come out of these things being like who do i owe an apology to and it's tricky because i tell people i don't tell people like don't apologize but i say like you shouldn't be hard on yourself forgive yourself not your fault you didn't mean to do that like you're totally out of your mind but I also know your wife, your friends, your mom, whoever, that's like catching the fallout from your episode, from your behavior. Like just because they can intellectually be like, oh, it's that's not him. He didn't mean it, whatever. It still hurts, I'm sure. You know, and it also even if you're able to completely seal yourself off from that, it hurts just to watch your loved one suffer to begin with. So, yeah, I think people shouldn't feel guilty, but I also think it's inevitable that you're going to come away with a certain amount of guilt on you that you feel like you got to kind of rinse off. And you know, Zach, like, so growing up, there were so many instances I was so embarrassed of my mom, Mm -hmm. or there were times that she pushed people away or she caused problems, even up until like a few months before she really was properly diagnosed and psychiatrists and psychologists helped. But now I'm so sympathetic to her. Yeah. And I think, you know, just having these conversations is helpful so that like if a loved one does go through a bipolar episode and you realize, okay, he's acting this way or she's acting this way because yeah. she's having a psychotic break or she's highly manic or, you know, just yeah. the understanding is helpful, not just for the person who's dealing with the episode, but for the family member, husband or wife or loved one. You can kind of insulate yourself from some of the more harmful behavior, perhaps, but you still take in blows. Like you're still going to feel it. It might be more palatable to you, but there's just no way it doesn't affect someone if they love you. So I think this guilt that I preach against is inevitable. So I've been more trying to get people to dilute the guilt than be like, you shouldn't have any. And also sometimes I do deserve a little of the guilt, you know, like 
And that's behavior that led up to the break. I had an incident in Scotland last year that was horrible and like horrible. And I found myself like briefly suicidal, really, only for like a day, but it's all it takes, really. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. And ironically, that one probably caused the biggest rift in my family. And it was one that I probably had less responsibility for than perhaps my first one or second break. But I did something really stupid before I left. I didn't have my prescriptions ready, like my emergency medication that I'm supposed to travel with. So I went over there with only one or two out of van. It's obviously an international flight. Sleep schedule is going to be messed up. I was going there for a comedy festival. I was staying in a apartment with a bunch of other comedians. I was going to be performing and stuff. So A, bad planning on sleeping with a bunch of comedians. <laughs> B, rather than be like, you know what, I'll be fine. I'll take a different drug instead if I need to go to sleep. It's a prescription, but I'll be fine. I'm going to go. I mean, I should have just skipped my flight, really, and either not gone or rescheduled if that was financially possible. But there was no way I was skipping that. And I'm running out the door, like, late for my flight, like, without my proper medication. I mean, I had my daily, but I didn't have the emergency one I needed. Um, and the emergency is, like, if you start to feel... Yeah, it's, like, it's out of van, and I take it if I'm having, like, anxiety right, right. or need to sleep. Right. I usually just for sleep and rarely have to take it. I totally understand that. My mom is afraid to travel too far because she's afraid her sleep schedule will be thrown off and then something will happen. Well, I got yeah. invited to the Sydney Writers Fest last year and it was an amazing experience. And I knew it was going to be cool, but it, like, it was way better than I could have imagined it would be. But I was terrified. It was a 17-hour flight. I had to get there a few days early, right, you know, to make to sure. Yeah. And it's always a bit of a, anything over, you know, eight, 10 hours can be a little scary for me. But now, you know, and knowledge is powerful. Sure. And now you'll never travel without having your emergency drugs with you. And and in the meantime, you know, my wife and mom are here helpless, like crying and you know, screaming and afraid I'm not going to come back. Like while I'm saying like, you know, sorry, I love you, you know, kind of saying goodbye. Yeah, you're right. I learned a little something cool, but there's nothing I can say or learn or change going forward. That's going to like wipe that away from their consciousness and from, you know, that's going to stay with them, that pain. So yeah, you feel like, that's an example where it is kind of on me. I should have had that medication. And yeah, I can own a little blame there and take a little guilt on there. So yeah, I mean, I guess maybe it's not totally binary. All right. Well, I'm changing gears. Okay. And I saw that you just wrote, you know, oh, the copy yeah. for a comic yeah. for what it's like to be a 12-year-old girl with anxiety. Something for the... I know plenty about. <laughs> for the New York Times yeah. for kids. And I know that your writing has gotten a lot of praise from really great places like the Kirkus Review and the Huffington Post and the New York Times. There you go. I mean, the top. There you go. What are you working on now? Because you said you're writing. You're always writing. Yeah. What am I working on now? I think I started a book the other day. But I like that you think I mean, you don't <laughs> you're just know. outlining it, right? No, oh. I mean, I'm just writing. The oh, way I start, start is I just start writing. Amazing. Like, there's nothing to outline. I don't right. know what's going to Yeah, I you know. know. So I I'm know. just like, yeah. I mean, some people I'm sure start, you know, yeah. whatever. Everyone whatever has their own you. process. So I'm going to try to throw down like 20, 50 pages or something and see if there's anything there. But it's going to be. Is it nonfiction? Yeah. And it's going to be. It's pretty undercooked, the idea, but it's going to be on homelessness and on loneliness, some combination of theirs and my own. That's the like germ of an idea. And I could go more like specific, but it's just well, so un It sounds very timely. So, yeah. Zach, if you could write yourself a love letter to your 20-year-old self, mm. what would it say? 
a love letter to my 20 year old self. <laughs> what advice would you give? Buckle up. It's about to get bumpy in a couple of years, but don't worry. It'll kind of shake out. Okay. And then it won't. <laughs> and then it will. It's not really a love letter. It's more like life's about to get hard letter. I don't know. man. I mean, be easy on yourself once you, <laughs> you know, once the things that are about to go poorly, go poorly. Be easy on yourself, I guess is what I'd say. And if I can use my like future predicting powers, I'd say like this, you know, this kind of all work out a little bit for you. Something good at least will come of it. I don't know if it's all going to work out for me. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> being easy on yourself, I think we all need to kind of like be kind to ourselves yeah. the way we talk to ourselves. I think we all need to work on that. Yeah, yeah definitely. Do you have any happiness habits or anything that you do that's kind of helps ground you or? I mean, I know the things that I do that make me happy. I don't know that I'm good at practicing them and I don't know that I'm happy, <laughs> but I mean, I'm writing a book on loneliness right now, mm -hmm. but for me, the difference between like a bad day and at least mediocre day is a thousand words. Like if I write a thousand words a day, I feel like I did something with myself, with my day. And it's not even like, oh, I feel productive. Like I could mop the floor right now and feel semi-productive, but I wouldn't feel fulfilled. So writing brings yeah, you... Yeah, that's my guy. Yeah. But it could be a 20-mile bicycle ride too, or you yoga or box or whatever the hell you do. Go watch comedy, go watch a play, watch a movie, journal. I don't really Are journal, you doing comedy? But... Are you still doing it? You're right down the street from comedy. The, yeah, the Laugh yeah, Factory. Laugh factory comedy yeah. Store. Not really. I'm kind of comedy adjacent right now. I'm writing a <laughs> script with a comedian in New York. I think I've accepted that it's a dream that will never die. And I'm going to have to make a full court press at some point to try to pursue stand up. I just don't know where that like fits in my right now it's just right not now. okay well yeah. i see that for you i mean i will take a swing someday i'm just kind of yeah. trying to go about it a smarter way than the first time and not look like the mental stuff just meaning like that open mic world right. we talked about i'm trying to just like do a little and run around that and like get something together that i actually feel good about and can start like kind of doing or like mid to upper tier shows hopefully so I will have in my show notes links to your book and a few other things we discussed today. Cool. But where can the listeners find you? Do you want to give any social media? I'm on Instagram. Okay. I'm at Wichita Zach is my handle. Uh -huh. I'm actually, let's put it like this, I'm pretty easy to find. Okay, cool. You That's true. Yeah, yeah I found you and you yeah. were so awesome and got right back to me. <laughs> I have a website too. I guess it's, I'm not very really active with it, but it's ZachMcDermott.com. Okay, great. Yeah. I'll include that. Yeah. Cool. And I really just want to thank you so much for opening up to me and, yeah. you know, no me kind of surprising you. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. We can tell that story. Oh, uh, okay. It's well, funny. yeah, Zach forgot I was coming uh -huh. and, and I showed up at his front door and he was like, oh. Oh, shit. I, I looked, <laughs> he was on the phone and uh, then he had to go and brush his teeth, but it's all good. And yeah, put a shirt on. I, put a shirt on. No, yeah. you're wearing a shirt. It's just I, inside I was, out. But... but I had to go put one on. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I'm wearing an inside out oh, t shirt. Yeah. Unshowered, <laughs> dirty apartment. It's uh, perfect. I almost it's didn't perfect. answer the door. Oh, I, I'm so glad you I did. I looked because I don't have your phone number. Like, <laughs> Who is this? <laughs> I don't funny. look too intimidating What's at least. What's funny right? is like, I've seen your picture <laughs> right. like once, you know? Yeah. So I was like, she actually looks kind of familiar. Like, I think I Where know do I her. know her from? <laughs> and yeah. That that's was, awesome. That's, that's awesome. Well, again, thank you. I really <laughs> want to thank you. And I'm excited for everyone to hear this. And I wish you luck on all your writing and on everything. Thanks. All right. Well, you take care. Yeah, you too. Thanks for having me. I want to thank Benjamin King for that awesome intro you heard at the beginning and for helping me produce this podcast. And thank you to Ari Silverman, the music composer. This is Rachel Steinman. For more information or to contact me with any questions, comments, or guest ideas, please check out rightnowrachel.com. That's right with a W. Thank you so much for listening, subscribing, and sharing, dear family. And if you found value in what you've just heard, I would love and so appreciate a great review on Apple Podcasts, 
Stitcher, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Until next time, I wish you love, happiness, and good mental health.